Ramzan Yatra. What, what a privilege to be here. Um, it's been a fantastic couple of days, so um, I feel really honored to be able to uh, speak to you a little bit about uh, what I do. Um, I'm going to start on a, uh, a suitable contrarian note. I don't have any like awesome videos or superb soundtracks. All my toenails are intact. Um, <laughs> um, but what I do have are a couple of anecdotes and stories that will hopefully give some of you, um, uh, well, some of you might find helpful in your careers and your, uh, and uh, in what you guys are doing. So there's my clicker. Uh, okay. So um, I'm an industrial designer, and I guess I'm known for um, a particular kind of visual language. And it's driven by my interest in um, the objects around us, the objects and the surfaces around us, and the um, ability they have to make us all feel something. Um, every object around you at the moment has the ability to make you feel happy, sad, sick, um, elated. And we use this understanding in our work to um, try to create objects and experiences that um, evoke um, emotive feelings, positive emotive feelings. And we call this emotive industrial design. So we use um, form, color, texture to try to create objects that elicit joy. That is our objective. So we work across um, uh, so we combine this with um, efficient production techniques in order to uh, reach broad audiences. That's really key to what we do. So regardless of the kind of brand sector that we're working across, whether we're working for uh, luxury brands or um, entry-level products, everything we do is geared towards broad audience appeal. And that is the difference between creating you know, a beautiful object and something that people, you know, a, a, lots of people can engage with and have an emotive response to. Um, just a very sort of brief background. Um, I started my career in 1995. I graduated from St. Martin's College in London. And I went to work as a freelance designer for five years. I was working with brands like British Airways. Uh, I, tr I was trying to find a, a period correct advert, so uh, it's, it's, the resolution is not very good. But I worked with a team who basically revolutionized um, the business class and the first class cabins. Um, all of these cabins that you see these days, um, I had never had the privilege to fly in one of these, but uh, in the first class ones anyway. Um, but these kind of cocoon cabins where you can lie down flat. I was working with that team. Uh, I didn't work on that project, but other exciting projects with that team. So they, they were really innovative. I worked for a Japanese fashion designer doing uh, mainly eyewear accessories for uh, London Fashion Week and Paris Fashion Week. Um, and lots of other brands, and then I joined the Nokia design team in uh, 2000. Now, now, in those days, Nokia was the number one mobile phone brand. Um, and I left Nokia in 2005 to set up my own practice. We're based in London, and uh, we're also now opening a branch office in Helsinki, because I don't know if you, some of you have heard, you know, we've got a slight... Uh, political situation in the UK uh, at the moment. <laughs> um, and, you know, we work on brand design language, like creating DNA, design, brand design DNA uh, for companies is, you know, really at the core of what we do. We do product development, concept forecasting, and future study. And we work on all sorts of brands from startups to um, most of the ones that you see here, all the ones you see there, actually. So... Um, I think all of us as designers and creative people get asked quite frequently, what inspires you? So I thought I'd get this kind of slide out of the way because basically I never know how to answer this question because inspiration comes from, from everywhere. So what I did, I quickly looked at my phone, looked at my most recent uh, Instagram posts, um, and I picked a couple at random and I just put them up. So this is the Metro in Helsinki. And 
I love orange, and I love the fact that there are not many colors going on in this image. I just love all the orange. And what also is quite interesting, I don't know if anyone's been to Finland before, uh, but they have beautiful long summers with um, really, really like long days where it hardly ever gets dark. Um, and then they've got a few months of winter. That winter is coming. It's like that. It's like pretty dark and gray a lot of the time. And I found it really interesting, this kind of contrast, that um, at that time of the year, you have to be underground somewhere to feel brighter than uh, when you're outside. So, uh, and then we've got, uh, I was at Helsinki Zoo as well recently, a couple of weeks back, and there was this uh, little jungle cabinet uh, that I was looking at, the lizards, and I saw this amazing little turquoise gecko, I found him, uh, extremely uh, inspirational, and then he looked at me, the cheeky little fucker, and um, uh, yeah, it's just random little things. Uh, this is a letter written by Stanley Kubrick. Now, I'm a big fan of Stanley Kubrick, um, and I, I'm sure that uh, most of you might be familiar with the 2001 Space Odyssey. So, in London at the moment, uh, there's uh, the Stanley Kubrick exhibition at the Design Museum. And I went to see it. That's the second time I've seen it, actually, because I saw it also once in Barcelona. And they've got all sorts of fantastic props there. And a really interesting one I found was this letter that Kubrick had written to IBM Computer. Uh, and who's seen 2001? OK, so a few of you. You might be aware that there's a computer in it called Hal, uh, is this, uh, who kind of goes a bit crazy. And um, in this letter, um, Kubrick is trying to find a, a concept for this computer called HAL. It's not called HAL at the moment. He's using IBM's help to come up with the idea, and it's called Athena. So I've got a little transcript here. I'm going to read a couple of bits for you because I thought it was quite interesting. It says, Dear Roger, the IBM Athena drawings are useless and totally irrelevant to our needs, and what I must presume were Fred's discussion with so-and-so, I can't remember, read that bit, um, and most certainly irrelevant with my discussions with Fred. I am extremely bored and depressed with all of this. Uh, please contact Fred and discuss it with him, blah, 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 blah. I want detailed design concepts. Um, I want mostly equipment, and I'll take a remote typewriter or anything else they'll give. I must have something definite soon, blah, 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 blah. There's absolutely no time to waste. And he ends with, I know this is not your fault or Fred's. And don't take this as criticism of yourselves. It is merely a total fuck up. <laughs> which not only fails to give what was hoped for, but cost time. Annoyed and depressed, but lovingly, S. <laughs> so I was deciding whether to use this as some sort of management style in my studio, but I thought, hmm. Um, and then the last one actually was taken from the airport uh, on the way from Mumbai to uh, the hotel, and I love this image because uh, there's so much kind of contrast going on, and it kind of all comes together as some uh, beautiful composition in color and, uh, and function. That's what's so interesting about this. So there's a couple of things that um, you know, inspire me. 2001 has always been a constant inspiration for me, pu purely because it's, a, um, a, it's a, what I call a total product experience. It's a real piece of art. So there's a narrative, there's visual stimulation, there's you know, amazing soundtrack, there's periods of silence in the movie, which are you know, really, really interesting. Um, so I go back to this as some sort of you know, reference quite often because it's, it's, it's one of those rare, timeless uh, experiences. So um, on the contrary, when uh, Rajesh sent me, sent me uh, an email to uh, ask if I would be, uh, if I'd like to take part in this year's Design Yatra uh, with the theme, on the contrary, I, <coughs> I didn't really know how to respond to it initially because I thought, contrary? Am I, you know, am I a contrarian? I mean, I've been called many things in the past, um, mainly a pain in the ass. Um, as, I don't think it's because I'm a horrible person. I think it's because I'm quite, I'm a little bit OCD with detail, and I believe that it's the, it's the small things, the tiny details that make the biggest difference. Um, and you know, we use this kind of understanding in, in our work and what we do. 
And you know, it's, I think it separates, it can make the difference between what is a nice object and a memorable object. And they're two different things, I think. So anyway, it made me think, um, this word contrary. And um, I kind of traced my career back over the last sort of, 20 years or so, and I kind of figured out, actually, it's, there are quite a few projects that I've been lucky enough to be involved in that have been quite different to what the prevailing trends were of the day. Um, and then, you know, one, uh, one little quote came to mind, which I remember. Uh, this was written by one magazine, tech magazine, I can't remember, T3 or stuff, says, the Nokia designers have been smoking the wacky backy again. So that's from 2003. Any of you who don't know what wacky backy is, it's marijuana, so they were saying that I was stoned whilst I was designing something. Um, and I kind of always remember that. And it was referring to this product called the Nokia 7600. Now that was um, a big deal for Nokia in those days because that was going to be the first um, mass production 3G product. So we're all, you know, we're all 3G, 4G, 5G. Um, you know, that, this is all kind of normal stuff for us now. But back in the day, there weren't any 3G products. And the Nokia 7600 was going to be the first one. And Mark Mason, design manager, came to me with this brief. Tej, do you want to design something crazy? And I was like, what the fuck does that mean, man? It's like, you know, how, how do you respond to that? Um, are you saying that you know, everything I do is a bit twisted? Or you know, what, I didn't really know what to do about it. At that moment, I was studying some of Zaha Hadid's work. I was fascinated by her approach to communication and how she, I mean, she's absolutely amazing with her acrylic paintings. I mean, and the way that she communicated her work. And um, I was completely immersed in this kind of world for a little while. And I was looking at one book when Mark came over and presented me with that, uh, with that brief. And within a, a couple of moments, I literally just used, I, I remember it quite clearly, it was that image. And I basically just drew a couple of lines. And then within five minutes or so, even less, uh, I just shaded them up. And I thought, oh, OK. Um, you yeah, know, this could be quite interesting. Now, Nokia in those days, man, it was like Disneyland for designers. It was an absolutely amazing place to be, full of the most brilliant, inspirational, um, and uh, positive people that um, you know, I had the privilege to work with in my career. And you know, those of us who worked at Nokia in those days, when they, they were number one, we really count ourselves as, as quite lucky to have been part of that experience uh, and meet so many interesting people, like my wife, for example, who I uh, who I met at work uh, in my department, which was a bit difficult uh, uh, <laughs> sometimes. Um, but anyway, so, so amazing was Nokia that from that sketch came that product, which to me is very, very similar to what I had drawn. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, and, you know, at first glance, it looks a bit crazy. I mean, you know, there are keys on the side of the screen. It's a funny shape. I mean, you know, what people looked at that, the press looked at it, thought, well, what the fuck is that? Um, but there was a real methodology to this object. 3G was all about image. It was all about video. And it was all about the ability to be able to share with people. And in those days, when you sent a text message, if you wanted to text quickly, you know, you'd be like this, and you'd be using two hands. So what we wanted to do with this was to keep the, make the display the hero of the product, because it's all about the screen, and it was all about the image. And then we were um, thinking about how people text with two hands, and we wanted to create this really comfortable two-handed object. So I remember when uh, this was launched, it got you know, mixed reviews, um, some very positive, uh, some uh, like uh, the one that Marcus Fairs wrote. Do you guys know Dezine? Anyone know the Dezine blog? So Marcus Fares is the editor for Dezine. He's a good friend of mine now. Um, and back in the day, before Dezine, he was the founder and editor of Icon Magazine, which was a print magazine. And you know, he didn't write a very positive review about it, and I thought it was stupid. Um, a few months later, uh, I went to the Milan Furniture Fair, and I was in one of the <laughs> exhibits. I can't remember where. And I see Marcus standing over there, and I went over to him. And 
before I reached him, I kind of, he had something in his hand, and he was like, you know, texting away and doing something, and he was holding that phone. <laughs> but I thought, hey, Marcus, what the fuck are you doing, man? I said, I thought he didn't like that thing. He goes, oh, my God, I used it. It's amazing. I said, well, why didn't you use it before you wrote that article? But, <laughs> but um, you know, there's, you know so there's this kind of method to the madness, and there was some real innovation. I mean, there's... Working with Nokia, you know, to deliver a product like this, you're working with 100 people or more. I'm just one little cog in the wheel, although, you know, it's my design and I'm the creative director for this project. There's hundreds of other brilliant engineers and software guys and, and mechanical engineers who, who make all this happen. And there was real innovation here because, you know, we're injection molding real leather and real suede in volume, and nobody had done that before. And I think that, you know, we worked for a long time to get that right, and I'm pretty sure that most of that team wanted to kill me. But eventually, we kind of we got there. So it really was, a, you know, all of the projects at Nokia were like this. They were really about fostering creativity, and they were one of the only brands, tech brands in those days, who were championing design. They were the, one of the only brands who publicly spoke about design as being one of their core values, and that was, I think, really... Um, you know, that has helped all of us, in a way, because that has really created awareness for design and industrial design and all sorts of design and creative fields um, relative to, um, you know, the big brands and kind of what we do. So after that, um, they, they kind of gave me all these other crazy projects. I was always the one who's getting the crazy projects to work on, like this one here, which is, an, the, they called it the lipstick phone. It was the 7280. Now, the original idea for this was, um, it was quite good, it was a, because phones were quite big, this was going to be a small phone, like a little brooch, that you can wear, you know, you can clip it to your shirt, or uh, take it out with you to dinner or parties, or wherever it was, and you could, the idea was, it's a second phone, and all you could do with it is make calls, that's it. But, the marketing department got hold of it, and then they, they wanted to have, oh, you've got to be able to make a text message with it, and oh, you've got to be able to, oh, it's got to have a radio, because you know, all the phones had radios in those days. And before you know it, you kind of got this, this product that started small and had a sort of good idea, turned into this full-size product with no keyboard, completely pain in the ass to use. So, um, you know, it is interesting, because the, when this collection was launched, the Nokia share value went up by six points, but actually, it was, it was quite a shit phone. Um, uh, but, you know, people remember it, and they, you know, Nokia were launching 60 phones a year. My God, you know, Apple comes along and just blows them out of the water with, like, one phone. Um, but, you know, it was, um, uh, yeah, anyway, good place to work. But the lesson that I learned I, after I left and set up my own practice was it's okay to be polarizing. It's okay not to try um, and, uh, you know, if, if you want to design something that has a real point of view, it's okay to do it. But be strategic about it, because you're never going to please everyone, but you can try and, um, you know, engage as many people as you possibly can. Anyway, so I, I left Nokia in 2005. I set up my own practice with my brother, um, and uh, the first product that we were briefed on was finally a telephone. None of these, uh, I hasten to add. Um, but in those days, decked telephones all looked like this. Um, and I couldn't understand why they looked like this, because first of all, I was, they were kind of mimicking uh, like mobile phone design language. It's not a mobile phone, it's a home phone, so why does it look like that? And none of them kind of were designed, or you know, it, I think technology in general, wasn't really approached from a design point of view to fit into your interior or your home. It's like, you know, who's, what kind of home is that going to look good in? Um, so, you know, this was a kind of a real driver for us, and the, the brief for us was to design a, uh, a low-cost product, like this retail for like 15 pounds in those days. Um, and, you know, we really wanted to sort of do something completely opposite to what the prevailing trends were of the day. There were no simple products on the market. So we wanted to create something very, si very simple, very cheap. And um, uh, there it is. I mean, I think it had kind of moderate commercial success. 
Um, but it definitely, the client loved it, and it you know, paved the way for quite a good relationship with those guys. Um, but one of the learnings from this project was, um, well, actually, one of the stories from this is that a couple of years ago, maybe five years ago, four or five years ago, this was designed in uh, 2005, so uh, a long time ago. But a few years back, I started getting these phone calls, like from um, these random calls at home on my mobile phone. It's like someone would ring and they'd just say, hello, and then hang up. And I thought, you know, occasionally this kind of thing happens, but man, it was happening like two or three times a day for like a couple of weeks. I thought, what the fuck? So one time someone called and they said, hello. I said, hello. And they said, who is this? And I said, well, fuck, who the fuck are you, man? Why are you phoning me? And it turned out <laughs> that um, I asked him, I said, you know, why do people keep, you know, what's going on here? Loads of people keep phoning and I don't understand why you guys are calling me. He goes, well, we had this, uh, an image of this product on some sort of school test paper, right? And I don't know if, well, I'm not going to flick back, but the image before it had a number in the display, uh, like a dickhead, uh, because I thought I was being clever, you know, trying to get my, you know, the contact details across. I'd put my personal mobile phone number on the display. <laughs> and they said, we just wanted to know who it was. <laughs> So, you know, the lessons from, from this project was, you know, look, be brave, don't follow prevailing trends, you know, don't design Dalek phones, use common sense and <laughs> do your own thing and definitely don't put your phone number on any, any products. Um, right, does anyone know who this is? Right, okay, so this guy is Michael Dell from Dell Computer. And why have I got a picture of him on, 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 this, uh, on this presentation? So um, I remember this very clearly. It was a Monday morning. And uh, I came, in those days, our studio was in our house. So we had a three-story house, and the second floor was studio. So I came down, my box of shorts, and I realized that, oh, yeah, I need to order some more computers for the studio. In those days, the best computers that we could use were Dell because they were powerful enough to run the kind of CAD software that we needed to. We couldn't use Macs because they didn't have the right type of graphics cards for our applications. Um, Dell were well-priced. They were, had a, you know, a great warranty. And so for a business like ours, you know, they ticked all the boxes except one. They looked horrible. Um, this is my actual one that I dug out of, uh, of the, the cupboard the other day. Um, and this is like from other 2004. I don't know, 2005 or something like this, um, but I, I was so frustrated looking at this product and then the website because, you know, I realized that if I have to order new computers, they're all still going to have to look like this, and it was kind of making me feel sick. So I started to write this email, and it was, you know, it turned out to be, I'm pretty sure, like the longest email I've ever written to anybody. And it was basically a frustrated rant uh, and a kind of critique on this object, you know, talking about surfacing and like, you know, why are there like, angles on that surface and it's, it, they serve no purpose. And I don't know what I was thinking, man. It was like Monday morning. I was like, and um, I'd written this email. And I, I have to say, I did feel better after it. Uh, and I didn't know what to do with this email. I thought, oh, what do I do with it? Maybe I should send it to someone. Oh, uh, who do I send it to? Who do I know at Dell? Uh, I don't know anybody at Dell. Um, okay, um, let's Google uh, Dell people. And then Michael Dell, who's that? He's the CEO. Okay, fuck that, I'm going to send it to him. Um, I don't have his email address. Um, so I started to invent email addresses, like loads of them. Just, just I, I, <laughs> I really didn't think anything was going to happen. So I just invented loads of email addresses and then sent the email and went, had a, went to have a cup of coffee, and then 20 minutes later, there was a ping in my inbox, and I'm like, oh, who's that? And I looked at it, and it was Michael Dell, who one of those email addresses had worked. <laughs> and he said, it was just one line, he goes, okay, you've got my attention. And I was like, oh, fuck. So we had two hours of really interesting dialogue, actually, over email. Uh, there was no kind of WhatsApp in those days. Um, and in the end, he wrote, OK, come to Round Rock, which is, his head, which is HQ. I'm going to give you one hour. Not to get there, but I'll give you one hour when you get there. Um, 
<laughs> so I was like, oh my God. And it was like, you know, he had the slot, he had the secretary call me, like he had the slot the next week, and I was like, oh my God, I need to prepare. So I started making this presentation. And then, you know, we just put some, you know, I had to book the flights, and I'd never been to Austin, Texas before. Has anyone been to Austin, Texas? There you go. So you know, it's well worth a woo-woo. Um, it's, uh, it's a fantastic place, loads of great bars and party atmosphere and music and very nice. So I took a few extra days to have a, have a look around. Um, and I'd, I'd taken with me just some very simple, like, non-color, uh, quick mock-ups that we made, a big presentation, and then some just simple kind of block models, basically. Uh, and I went to you know, the Round Rock office, and uh, I was greeted by Michael. And uh, he had a, a colleague with him. And um, I'm not going to tell you his name, but let's just call him John Smith. He had John Smith with him. And I'm like, who is this John Smith character? You know, I'm here to meet Michael. So I'm just focused on Michael Dell. And I was like, whoa. Um, so we went into the meeting room. And I started going through my presentation. And then I was using, you know, I was using this thing as an example. And I was saying, oh, look at this. You, know, you guys have got so much potential. You have to, you have to, you're tooling these products yourselves. You're not buying them off the shelf. You're paying for tooling. It doesn't cost you any more to tool it differently in a way that kind of makes people feel something much better than that, because that doesn't kind of fit anywhere. Um, anyway, so I was going on and on, and we, I mean, he gave me an hour. I was in there for a couple of hours. Um, and uh, yeah, he, in the end, he looked at me in the eye. He sat at me and he goes, you know what? You're preaching to the converted. And he said this, he goes, we want to do business with you. And I was just like, yes, awesome. Uh, this, my, the John Smith dude, he really wasn't that, uh, I, I couldn't really get a read off this guy, man. I was like, what the fuck is this problem, man? So anyway, I went back to London, and I was like, you know, he, he, Michael Dell said, look, you're going to be dealing with John, um, and he's going to get in touch with you. So I went back to London, and I started, like, doing some research into who this John Smith dude is. Oh, God, man, he turned out to be the product manager for that product. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> what a disaster, man. Oh, my God. So, um, anyway, we didn't get that project. Uh, <laughs> so, so the, the, the learning from that is know your audience, do your research. Um, yeah, that's a, it's a really key one, that one, uh, for us. Anyway, so a couple of years later, so we'd be doing you know, loads of te like, uh, telecoms products. Um, you know, people just kept approaching us because of this Nokia background. And, oh my God, I've only got eight minutes. Um, so we really wanted to explore design language, that you know, emotive design language. I wanted to do my own take on it without a brief. Uh, we were normally given like PCBs to work around um, when we were designing products. And uh, this time, I wanted to present something fresh, like completely from a clean sheet of paper. So we designed this product. We're quite well known for it. It's, it doesn't do anything fancy from a technology point of view. It's only a home telephone. Um, but the client was, we showed it to a client, or uh, SGW, who didn't brief it to us, but we said, you know, what do you think about this? And they were like, fuck, that's awesome, let's do it. Um, but, you know, this is just about design. There's nothing technologically interesting about it, apart from, well, there's no nothing interesting about it, except the way that it looks, and the way it makes people feel. Because what we did was something very simple. We split the product in two, to give it this kind of old school dog and bone feel. And that's kind of very sort of key to what we do. It's kind of tapping into um, something familiar whilst delivering something new and fresh. And it's kind of getting that combination right that is uh, something that you know, we try and do in, in all of our work. At the same time, we designed this, which is the HAL TV. It was for an unknown brand called Humax. And uh, they were like... Um, uh, like experts in set-top boxes, like those sky boxes that you get under your TV. Not very interesting, but they also had a line of televisions, which when I looked at them were absolutely horrible. So I called them up, I said, look, and they were local, the office was local to us, weirdly. So I called them up, I said, look, do you guys want to do like a little project together? Um, it can be like a concept experiment, and we'll uh, go and present it at the Milan Furniture Fair, which is kind of what we did. So that's the front and that's the back. So this is designed in a completely toolable way. 
So it looks like a concept, but actually, if you wanted to put it into production, you could do it straight away without incurring any more, any more expensive tooling costs to like a regular television. This, we, we did this in 2008. So we thought, oh, what do we do with this? Uh, let's go and present it at the Milan Furniture Fair uh, with this new telephone, just to talk about design language and technology. And uh, the result was like this overwhelming, it just went berserk, but everyone wanted to sort of write about it, and uh, they were contacting us, I had Jonathan Ross phoning us, I said, I want one for his t TV show, and Joanne Wally Kilmer, and all these kind of crazy characters started calling our studio, and we really didn't know what to do with it, all this info. Um, but what it did do is really cement in our head how we want, what, you know, where we wanted to go with industrial design and what we could like, offer that, you know, this field and what we wanted to continue doing. So that led to loads of other projects. I'm going to kind of speed through these because I'm running out of time quite quickly. Um, this, you know, for me, is one of the most all-time beautiful objects. It's super functional. It's the Porsche 917 uh, racing car from the 60s. And what I love about this is it's absolute purpose. Its purpose is to win races. Its purpose is to win. That is a key function. But at the same time, it looks amazing. You know, it's got these beautiful colors. You know, they were all very, uh, the approach was very similar. You'd use two colors and you'd use some typography and you'd put it on this like beautiful, soft looking object. And, um, you know, I just think these are absolutely beautiful. And so when we were approached by the next telecoms uh, company, which was a startup geared towards, um, uh, like, like the youth market, I wanted to use this kind of thing as inspiration. Mobile, mobile phones in 2009 were still very rectangular black blocks. Uh, and Blackberries, Blackberries were very popular because it was all about uh, uh, Blackberry Messenger. I don't know if anyone remembers that, but everyone was doing these uh, texting things with QWERTY keyboards. So we presented these kind of very soft shapes to the client. And um, you know, to, they, they were a brilliant company to work for because they were really sort of... Um, uh, sort of avant-garde in their approach. Uh, you know, we were helping them to define a DNA for them, uh, like a new DNA for their products. And it was a very young team, and they were just super, super fun. They're really good friends of ours now. In fact, all of the projects that we've done with people who we've linked up, who we're, you know, who are sort of like-minded and we've made a great relationship with. They've all kind of turned into like personal friends, which is kind of very nice. So from, they kind of were you know, really up for it. So we used this kind of soft language to sort of create these kind of concepts where, uh, you know, in those days when you had a camera on your phone, it was a big deal, and you'd put the number next to it, which told you how many megapixels the camera was, five megapixels. Um, so I, was, I wanted to use those kind of graphics, that kind of graphical approach from, the, from those old racing cars to create something that was quite new and easily and instantly recognizable as a piece of physical DNA for the brand. Um, and then that, uh, this was the production product. So it changed a little bit to, to the original one, but it retained this sort of nice softness. Uh, this is the first fully stainless steel mobile telephone uh, with a QWERTY keyboard and a curved display. No one was doing curved displays at that time. So that was the sort of the, the power of working with, you know, energized, uh, smaller energized teams who were kind of thinking on the same kind of level, same direction as you were. So brilliant brand, brilliant company to work for. Um, mobile phones were kind of looking, this is how mobile phones were in, in uh, when did I do that project? 2000, when was that number five out? 2000 and no, a little bit, 2012, something like this maybe? I don't know, some, sometime around there, mobile phones look like this. And then, um, uh, you know, we work with many Asian clients, um, you know, brilliant clients to work for, but, you know, often you come across clients that, you know, give you loads of work and they're super, super um, excited to work with you, but it's very difficult because of the size of the organization sometimes to sort of get the more sort of interesting projects through. So the previous project was one where you were working with a small team and it was like easy to get through production. And I'm not going to tell you the brand that we, worked with, that we did, you know, these kind of concepts where we did loads of them. Um, but uh, these ones, you know, didn't work out so well. And we tried really, really hard to kind of get those, get those guys going to make something different to what these were. Um, so, okay, uh, how much time we got left? So my studio is all about this. We're about kind of goosebumps. Um, if, and we're very, you know, every, we're five people in the studio. Everyone's very equal. 
Um, some are more equal than others. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, seriously, everyone, everyone has a say, from their admin staff to all of the designers, juniors, seniors, whoever it is. Um, you know, I really want everyone's input, and, you know, I want them to, you know, involve me in what they're doing, and we're all kind of involved. And one thing is for sure, if four out of five of us get goosebumps and the fifth one doesn't, the client is not going to get them either. Everyone in the office has to get the same kind of feeling, and we know when a product is ready when you get these. And we do this through iteration, uh, you know, I do loads, of, everything has got a very hand sketch, we're kind of very analog and digital at the same time, but there's a big sort of analog component to what we do, moving with hundreds of these sketches for a hairdryer, just moving lines around by, you know, a one mil here, a half a mil there, and the, the, the differences are huge. Uh, this is a salt and pepper mill that we did. <coughs> it's just a concept for, it's just a, a, a concept that we're studying in the office. Um, but we did like 20 of these, or many, even more, like 3D prints, just to check the dimensions and the size and the volume and how it feels and how it looks. And, and you know, every time you're changing things on an increment of a millimeter or half a millimeter or uh, a quarter of a millimeter or a tenth of a millimeter, and all these little increments make a massive difference. And I'm pretty sure Bronca, who was working on this project at the time, she wanted to kill me at the end of this. In fact, she wrote me a letter that said that she was going to resign, but she didn't. Um, so, um, anyway, that was kind of the finished thing, and the idea was that, you know, salt and pepper shakers, they always leave some crumbs on the table, and they're always a pain in the ass to fill. So this is the kind of a quick studio project to kind of, uh, oh, time's up, it says there. And it says, no crumbs, and it's easy to fill. So everything we do has to have a function. If it doesn't function, it's not a product, it's a piece of art. So um, that's a concept. Uh, what is that? Ooh. So ooh. Uh, we're missing a slide there. But anyway, um, so have I got a couple of extra minutes? So. Um, there's a, there should be a slide there that says identity. It's kind of missing. Um, and what I want to say about identity is, you know, we've been looking over the last couple of years at our own brand identity and um, trying to figure out what it is that we stand for and what we do. Um, because I found that, you know, although we do all this work for our clients, we're finding it very difficult ourselves to articulate what, uh, what it is that, you know, we offer that's different to to um, you know, our, yeah, other people. And um, I think that's you know, really, really important is to have a, have a look inside yourself and, and, and inside your business and your organization and, and really do this exercise because um, there's a lot of designers out there, a lot of people, you have to have a perspective. And I think you have to stand for something and I think you have to believe in something to, in order to get you know, your, the people you want to work with and the projects you want to work on to kind of believe in that as well. So what, what do we believe in? We've already kind of been through it, but it's just kind of, we want to create, use form and color and texture in everything that we do to elicit joy. And a few years ago, we had a, a project called, sort of last year, not a few years ago, called Soft Power. This is during the London Design Festival. And it was kind of like a retrospective of um, our work over the last 15 years with 15 different brands and, um, and we were launching some new products and showing some old products. And it was a really, really interesting exercise in sort of standing back and being able to look at what, you, you know, what we'd done in, in one space and really sort of help to crystallize and understand uh, and able, be able to sort of communicate quite clearly what it is that we are good at and the kind of companies that you know, we think might be suitable to work with us because sometimes you work with companies, you know, it's not a great fit. And if it's not a good fit, even though the project is there, it can be uh, not as fulfilling. Um, so anyway, um, the biggest lesson, you know, here about this whole identity thing is, you know, know who you are. Um, and uh, my time is out, but basically there's some just slides here. Have I got any more time? Look at Rajesh, man, that is a no. Uh, but anyway, these are just some 
products that we have launched that this thing uh, we did for a supermarket. It sold uh, a million units in one year, in one market. Uh, it was for Tesco. And Tesco are not known for technology, so they wanted to launch a product and a brand. So that's, you know, Emotive Industrial Design doing that. This is some furniture that we're kind of moving into for RT4, a Dutch brand, um, UK retailer, made.com. Everything, you know, every project has to function really well. A desk for home working, there's no way to put the cables. And I was really surprised that nobody had thought of this kind of idea of just slide the thing forward so you don't have to empty your desk of all the stuff before you want to plug things into the little cable holder. Um, Analog, tools, wallpaper, handmade, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and the last project, this is quite interesting because we were approached by Lexus uh, to, uh, early on this year to, um, with a really interesting brief. They said, do you want to design a tire? Have you ever designed a tire? No, we have never designed a tire. Um, do you want to design a tire? Okay, well, let's design one. Um, you've only got six weeks, they said. I said, what's it for? They said, it's for New York Fashion Week. I said, why do you want a tire for that? So, what they'd done is collaborated with this uh, LA-based designer, fashion designer, called John Elliott. Um, and he had designed this version of a Nike Air Force One shoe. And our brief was to um, design a tire using that as inspiration. Uh, the only thing was that it had to hold up this new Lexus, which like, weighs two tons. I've never designed a tire before. So how the fuck are we going to do that? So I called my friend Frank in Eindhoven. He does all our prototyping. I said, Frank, do you want to design a tire? He said, when do you need it? I said, six weeks. He said, are you crazy? Let's do it. So um, we did this crazy project in six weeks' time, from sketch to prototyping and building this thing. Um, and there's the tire. Uh, it's for Lexus. <laughs> So we use kind of leather and 3D printing and all this kind of crazy stuff. Uh, it's presented at New York Fashion Week with John Elliott, and that was, Lexus told us, the most successful social media campaign ever in their history. So anyway, blah, blah, blah. Uh, contrary, am I contrary? Uh, there were supposed to be some notes on this page. I don't know if I am or not. Uh, I would say that, um, you know, we try to create differentiation. That's our thing. You know, we want to we create really meaningful differentiation for brands. We don't see the point in um, uh, delivering something to brands that kind of looks the same as everything else. I think brands need to differentiate. They need to know who they are and what they stand for and have some balls. And that's kind of what we do. Okay. That's me. Thank you. Yeah.